My name is Madeline Hoffman, and I'd like to welcome you all to the Green Party Interstate Webinar Series, which tonight is sponsored by the Green Party US Peace Action Committee. And tonight, seeing as it is the 9th of August, uh, we our topic will be Never Again, Remembering the Atomic Bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it's really hard to believe um, as we're sitting here that it's already 78 years ago, um, since in 78 years since the atomic bombs were dropped in Japan. Um, we, are, we will be um, hearing from a really diverse and strong group of panelists and each will speak for eight to 10 minutes. And afterwards, there will be discussion um, after, the, after the insightful and thought-provoking presentations, there'll be discussion and questions. Um, again, my name is Madeline Hoffman and I'll be moderating the meeting. Uh, GPACS, the Peace Action Committee of the Green Party US, exists to facilitate the planning and achievement of peace and justice action proposals adopted by GPUS and to support and promote the party's anti-war candidates and agenda. Yes, and at times we're leading the discussion within the Green Party on what is a, a position, what is the position for peace and what is the Green Party position, not what is uh, State Department propaganda, or you know what's pass what passes for peace talks. Um, we at times we've been we've been called upon to push the discussion further, especially on the the war in Ukraine, Ukraine Russia. I'm going to start by just taking a couple minutes to talk about my own experiences that relate to the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, from the year 2001 through the year 2018. I was the director of a long time nonprofit organization, once known or formerly known as New Jersey, as SANE. And New, I was from New Jersey, living in New Jersey. So it was a New Jersey SANE which then became New Jersey Peace Action, because at the national level, we became Peace Action, not solely um, uh, concerned with the issue of nuclear weapons. Um, in, in 2015, I was honored to be asked to go to Nagasaki and Hiroshima um, as a guest of one of the women's committees in, in uh, Japan at the time, because of the long time, my long time work on the issue of nuclear weapons. And also the, the SANE, New Jersey SANE, National SANE, we were both founded in 1957. Um, our main goal at the beginning was to address the issue of nuclear proliferation, to fight against um, the nuclear arms race that had that had begun, um, and to speak out for the elimination, uh, ultimate reduction and elimination of nuclear weapons. And it's interesting, you know, between 1945 and 1957, that there was not really that a lot of activity on this issue because there was not a lot of discussion about it because there was a lot, uh, it was a lot that was kept secret. Um, but once the Japanese started talking at length about what had happened, uh, there was a need um, for people around the world to organize in solidarity with them, with the people of Japan. And um, I, We'll never forget um, being there on the 
uh, 70th anniversary of the bombings, um, first in Hiroshima and then in Nagasaki. And um, I'll just say that what I noticed is that people in Japan have not forgotten what happened at all, I've, I'm not even a, for a little while or a little bit. And the people, the Hibakusha, the people who were survivors of the atomic bombs, um, right at that point, almost 10 years ago, the average age was about 82. And so there was quite an effort underway, and I assume it continues today, to educate and inform the next generations of what had happened and what the what the terrors of the atomic bomb were um, and remain. And some of the people who continue to be affected by the radiation for our poisoning through generations, pass through generations. Um, and so, you know, they would come, the Habakusha would come to the US as guests of our peace organizations in New Jersey and the rest of the United States. And they would come in, they would come in droves, literally hundreds at a time to warn the world about the dangers of nuclear weapons, to say, never again, no more Hiroshima's, no more Nagasaki's. And I'll, I'll just, I know, um, you know a lot of people to speak, and I, but I'll open with, what I noticed, um, this was in Hiroshima, um, the river burned, we know that there were the, the, the heat in the river got to be, the cuts through Hiroshima got to be exceptionally high. And people who had been burned by the initial blast thought, they didn't know that, they thought they could jump into the river and cool off. But the opposite occurred. They jumped into the river and they burned even further. And so, you know, Hiroshima is a very clean place, spotless in many places. And I was walking along the river and there were little you know, gatherings of stones and buildings of stone, tiny buildings of stone. And there were empty plastic bottles on these um, piles of rocks. And I was like, how could this be such a, a neat and you know organized and careful people? Why are there um, empty water bottles on these monuments? And I asked somebody uh, a few a few days later, and they said because the people in the river died died of thirst. It was so hot they couldn't get any cold water, and we leave these empty plastic bottles of water on their monuments in order to give them something to drink. And this was 70 years after um, the, atom the, the bombs were dropped. And I think that gives you an idea of how deeply those bombs affected and impacted the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, same lists of victims everywhere, 140,000 in Hiroshima, immediately in 70,000, immediately in Nagasaki, and never an apology from the United States. Oh yes, President Obama went uh, to Hiroshima, but he he didn't meet with the Hibakusha, nor did he offer an apology. And as someone who, lives, who lived in the country for, uh, you know, almost 70 years in the United States, I'll never, um, you know, I'll never get over that. The United States needs to apologize. It needs to apologize to the world and shouldn't be messing around with the possibility of another, the un, another use of the atomic bomb, whether it's, you know, because of a conflict with Russia or with Ukraine, that it should never happen again. So after that, um, in that introduction, I would like to introduce, oh, and I should say I'm co-chair of GPACS, of the Green, uh, Green Party Peace Action Committee, and our first uh, 
speaker, not moderator, is Hai Hovanis. He's the co-chair of the Peace Action Committee of, of, of the Green Party of the United States. Uh, he's a peace activist with a professional background in information technology issues. Uh, technology has written, he has written and presented on a variety of defense-related technology issues. He holds an MBA from New York University. He is our committee's GPAC's most masterful word crafter and demonstrates this by formulating policies, positions, and speaking uh, for peace within a very short amount of time. Hi, you're on. Thanks, Madeline. Uh... I don't think I'm going to live up to that uh, praise in, in my segment, but uh, thank you for your firsthand uh, account. It must have been quite moving to be at the uh, location of those terrible events. It sure I'm, was. I'm going to jump ahead to the present day. Uh, the other speakers will probably talk more about the history and the implications, but I think it's important for everyone to realize why uh, the remembrance is so important because. Uh, we're right now in a very dangerous situation, and a lot has happened in the field of nuclear weapons since those first two dreadful attacks in, in 1945. Uh, people don't understand much about the technology of nuclear weapons, but they've become vastly more powerful. There's currently a, a film uh, about uh, Robert Oppenheimer that describes uh, Oppenheimer's uh, transformation from an, an ardent developer of nuclear, the first nuclear bomb into someone with uh, mixed feelings, guilt, and other uh, uh, considerations that ultimately led to him being driven out of the government. And I would advise you all to see it just to uh, understand the complexity. But uh, right now, uh, nuclear weapons are vastly more powerful than the ones that were dropped on Hiroshima. And I'm going to uh, play a short video that's a simulation of what uh, a modern day nuclear exchange would look like. It was developed by uh, researchers at Princeton University, and uh, it uh, makes clear the nature of escalation. Uh, escalation means a small conflict that grows into a larger conflict and then it engulfs the whole world. And um, this can happen very fast in the era of intercontinental ballistic missiles. It, it takes 30 minutes for an ICBM to cross the world. So the nuclear danger isn't this year or this month, it's this hour. Um, uh, I live in the metropolitan New York area. In a global nuclear exchange, New York would be hit by five to 10 nuclear warheads, each one of which is 10 times more powerful than uh, the one that hit uh, Nagasaki. Nothing is going to survive that in the metro area. So I guess we're starting with a bang, but uh, this is all very, very real. And uh, and uh, it's uh, according to the Doomsday clock, 90 seconds to midnight, which is closer than it's ever been since uh, the Cold War. So uh, Americans are, are asleep to uh, the gravity of this danger. And uh, I don't think uh, enough can be said to uh, try to wake people up. All right. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, people have questions, they can write them down and hold on to them to a little bit later. I just, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that people knew we had people downwinders. You know, the atomic, the, the testing of the atomic bombs out in the desert, so-called, so-called did impact many people as well. Um, you know, I used to be friendly with someone, you know, who was part of that movement to try to get compensation for even the U.S. soldiers who were watching the nuclear tests and nothing ever happened. Um, I mean, no compensation was offered. And then also Einstein, you mentioned Oppenheimer, Hyde. 
that um, Einstein said that it was even, you know, it was going to be even more difficult to deal with the consequences and the po politics of nuclear weapons than it was to figure out how to develop it. And I think those were prophetic words. Our next speaker will be Chris um, Stonebreaker Martinez. Uh, she, they are the co-director of the International Religious Task Force on Central America, a grassroots human rights organization that uses popular education, mutual aid, and direct action to transform consumer behaviors, uh, corporate and government policies for our collective liberation. Founded after US trained and funded military forces killed two Clevelanders working in solidarity with refugees in El Salvador in 1980. Uh, the task force is proud to center those impacted by state violence from Colombia to Canada and our shared work, especially Afro indigenous communities, workers, queer and disabled folks. The task force has co-founded the Cleveland, has co-founded co um, and participated in many uh, social justice projects in Cleveland. So C, you're up. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what I know about what's happening uh, around the world for um, anti-militarism and um, and given the current context that we're all living in together. I, if you don't already know, I want to let you know that we can celebrate the fact that the International Peace Bureau has nominated the Ukrainian pacifist movement along with the Belarusian organization and a Russian organization um, our house and the movement of conscientious objectors for the 2024 Nobel Peace Prize. All of these organizations focus on the right to conscientious objection. And um, part of the reason I'm telling you that is because uh, Mr. Yuri Shalia Zenko, uh, the executive secretary and an activist with the Ukrainian peace movement, was arrested on Saturday and was to appear in at the Ukrainian military court on Monday morning, um, just this past August 7th. Yuri had been invited by the Japanese Congress of Anti-Nuclear and Anti-Hydrogen Bombs to attend today's Nagasaki Memorial Service. August 6th was, as you all know, the 78th anniversary to remember Hiroshima when the first atomic weapon was used, quote unquote, in order to save any further loss of American, U.S. American soldiers. Over 140,000 lives were lost by um, that heat wave from exposure to nuclear ra radiation, but many more suffered cancer and other internal organ malfunctions related to radioactive expo exposure. Um, and I'm sorry if I pronounce um, any words wrong, but the Hibakusha, um, who had been exposed to nuclear radiation in Hiroshima, are now in their 80s. And there are only a few survivors who remain. Um, and to their and our great disappointment, I think to all of our disappointment, the leaders of the G7 meeting in Hiroshima in May never committed to banning nuclear weapons. They still hold the belief that um, quote unquote, keeping nuclear weapons is the only way to keep the security of the quote unquote free world against enemies who also have nuclear weapons. And disappointingly, as you just saw in the video that was just played, nuclear weapons are now 1000 times more effective to destroy the environment, including all living creatures. My dear friend from the International Fellowship of Reconciliation, um, Kyoko. Uh, Itaka sends these words from the J uh, Japan Fellowship of Reconciliation on the commemoration of Hiro Hiroshima. She says, we would like to appeal to people to use their voices against the use of cluster bombs, which Mr. Biden has given permission to Mr. Zelensky to use. More than 100 countries, including 
Um, the United Kingdom, France, and Germany have signed an international treaty uh, at the Convention on Cluster Munitions that outlaws the use or stockpiling of these weapons due to their indiscriminate effect on civilian populations. Children are particularly prone to injury as the bomblets can resemble a small toy left in a residential or farmland area and are often picked up out of curiosity. This reminds me, as an aside, um, this reminds me of the fields of Cambodia, Cambodia and Laos where landmines still injure children today. Uh, human rights groups have described cluster munitions as abhorrent and even a war crime. This also reminds me of the fact that uh, domestic criminalization that is allowed to perpetuate in our cities and states with the use of tear gas is also banned for use in war by the Geneva Convention, but is not banned on civilian populations worldwide. Um, as many of you know, tear gas that has been made in the United States has been tracked as being used in more than 100 different countries, including in my city of Cleveland during protests with the Movement for Black Lives, in Colombia, where my family is from, and in Palestine. I'm next going to be reading a quote by Frank Gardner, um, who is a BBC security correspondent, and um, this quote is from July 10th. Both Russia and Ukraine have been using cluster munitions since the start of Russia's full-scale invasion in February of 2022. Neither have signed the treaty banning them, nor has the U.S., but the U.S. has previously criticized Russia's extensive use of these weapons. In the absence of enough artillery shells, Ukraine has asked the U.S. to restock its supplies of cluster munitions to target Russian infantry um, and this has not been a an easy decision, I think, for Washington. Uh, and the decision is deeply unpopular, um, Mr. Um, Gardner says, with many Democrats and human rights advocates. So he goes on to say, what effect will the U.S. decision have? Um, an imme immediate effect might be to knock away much of the moral ground that Washington sits on in this world war. I know that I'm preaching to the choir. We know that the US is the, the US military in particular is the greatest purveyor of violence on the planet. And um, it doesn't really have a moral ground when it comes to imperialism of any form. But we also know that cluster munitions are a hideous indiscriminate weapon that is banned in much of the world for good reason. The U.S. will inevitably place what place it somewhat at odds with um, its allies and yada yada. Going back to my friend Kyoko, she um, wanted me to share this information with you from the Japanese Fellowship of Reconciliation, saying, "We urge you to use your voices against any war. Please protect Mr. Yuri Shilajenko. There are more people in the world who are going." with less food, with no clean water or necessary health care, who um, lack opportunities for education and vocational training, which would encourage people to become something other than child soldiers. During the war, uh, Japanese citizens were not allowed to speak out against the military government. Kyoko was nine years old when the war ended, and she says, I could remember how hard it was on civilians to have a war that they did not want to participate in. There was much control over the news media, much like what we live through now. And she is very afraid that the present situation in Ukraine is getting to be very much like that of Japan 78 years ago. She says she feels sympathy with those who do not want to fight. And there is no need to have a national hero or nationalistic honor. There's no winner in war. What a great reminder, Kyoko. Although people start fighting against aggression, uh, violence always causes further hatred and anger upon human beings. People go grow accustomed to the loss of human life. And so um, I'll wrap up my comments by saying, it's not the time, now is the time that we should stand up and say no more war, no more violence. Um, we're contributing to the military industrial complex and a few dictators who do not consider the welfare of all human beings. We cannot stop the confusion 
and violence of the present world right away, but we can at least share in the work together. This is lonely work and we need each other. We must support and defend each other, learn how to have each other's back, practice mutual aid, um, and just being, accompanying each other through the joys and sorrows of, um, of life and love living. There's no need to blame or criticize individuals. Um, we must really address these issues at the root. And now's the time to practice community and repair. Um, I say these words on behalf of all those people who have died in war while longing for peace where all people could share and live together. Thank you. So much C. Um, as uh, I would just add one thing that there is an international movement uh, to ban nuclear weapons in all respects, in all aspects. Um, but those countries that possess nuclear weapons have ignored it and have not participated. But the vast majority of people around the world know that nuclear weapons in humanity, human beings in the world are on a collision course. And I echo what you said, that something needs to be done and needs to be done now. And um, nobody's gonna survive a nuclear war. We, knew, we know that. So something needs to be done um, and now. And with those cluster bombs, I just, I remember Afghanistan and all the, all the kids who found um, remnants of unexploded cluster bombs who thought they were toys um, and haven't, you know, didn't survive a blast with those cluster bombs. All right, so we're going to move on to, uh, to Penny Hess, Chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Community, Committee who's an expert on why colonized people deserve reparations. She is named as one of the indicted Uhuru Three. Mm -hmm. The Uhuru Three is charged falsely with being unregistered foreign agents, allegedly under the malign influence, quote unquote, of the Russian government. Her apartment was the target of a militarized local and federal raid just over one year ago. The purpose of the raid was to intimidate the African People's Socialist Party from continuing to speak out for justice and reparations. Hess has written a book entitled Overturning the Cultural Culture of Violence. Now just insert, interject this. People of Japan know very well how to overcome cultural violence. They had 70 some odd years of without violence until the United States decided to put pressure on, on Abe to change their constitution. But that's another story for another day. Penny, um, we'll look forward to hearing you talk about what the situation is now. All right, thank you, Madeline. And I just wanna say Uhuru, Uhuru means freedom in Swahili. I want to thank the Missouri Green Party and, and all those who are participating in this important program tonight on this serious subject. As, as Madeline said, I am the chair of the African People's Solidarity Committee, the organization of white people under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. And I want to begin, as I always have to do, in saluting my leadership, Chairman Omali Shatella, and to say that everything that I know about the world, that I understand how the world got to be the way it is now and what is it gonna to take to change it, I have learned from Chairman Omali Ishitella and, and the organized African working class. Chairman Omali Ishitella has fought his entire life for the liberation of Africa and African people everywhere. And he is 81 years old and we see this fight to liberate Africa, to free it from colonialism and neo-colonialism and, and the poverty. We see the struggle in Niger right now and in West Africa and in, in South Africa and, and throughout the continent 
fighting to be free and liberated. And the mandate of the African People's Solidarity Committee, our work is to go into the white community and build solidarity with the African liberation movement and to win reparations for African people, which is what we do. And this is what I have done for 47 years because I joined when APSC, the solidarity movement was just formed back in 1976 and, and worked for, you know, to fight for reparations to African people before anybody even knew what the word reparations is, was and what it meant. And, and Chairman O'Malley Chatella was out there fighting for reparations and against the colonial domination of African and African people. And this is why um, in this year, in May of this year, Chairman O'Malley Chatella was indicted uh, by an absolutely false, racist, absurd um, attack and, and charges, along with uh, my comrade Jesse Neville and myself, um, that, that say that, that, that Chairman O'Malley is a Russian agent, as if he and African people do not have agency of their own to see what it is that the conditions that they face and fight against every single day. So I, I wanted to say that, that the 78th anniversary of the US bombing of Japan, as, we, as has been said, was August 6th. And today, August 9th, is the ninth anniversary of the colonial police murder of Mike Brown here in St. Louis. And I wanna say that these two historic events are connected. And I want to talk about that because if we don't get to the colonial question, the understanding that this system is built on the colonial domination of African indigenous and the majority of the people on the planet Earth, we can't, we can't ever, ever overturn nuclear, the nuclear threat of war and um, that that this system has to be overturned and wiped off this planet if there's ever going to be a time of peace and the ability of people to live, no one at the expense of anyone else and without this threat of war. And I, I do want to say that I and, and the African People's Solidarity Committee, I am not against all war. I am against all U.S. and colonial war. I am for the wars of national liberation that free the people of Cuba, the people, the African people, the indigenous people, the right to resist and fight the hell back and end their colonial domination. And, you know, just in, in looking at the video, I want to say that we can't forget, it has been said, but it has to be said very clearly. The one that developed the nuclear power and drop the bomb is only the United States. It is the United States and it's part and parcel what it has uh, what it has done to the people, the majority of the planet Earth. And you know, I remember years ago, I act, I asked Chairman O'Malley, well, what did he think about the threat <clears throat> of the of the nuclear bomb? And he said, for African people, for indigenous people, and for colonized people of the world, we've already had our nuclear bomb. And I think that, you know, that that was very, very illuminating to me because it's not just the threats that affect us, because everybody else on this planet has already faced genocide, torture, suffering, mass murder the lack of freedom for hundreds of years, the bomb of colonialism. And we didn't, as white people, do a damn thing about it. We helped perpetrate it. And it, you know, this is what fed us, what uplifted us out of poverty is the property, the stolen land and the resources from the stolen labor, from stolen human beings. And you know, this is why we have to understand what Chairman O'Malley Ishitella calls the colonial mode of production. That colonialism is not just a bad spot on history. It's not a bad policy. It's not something in the past. It is how all wealth is created 
for the white population, for the colonizer, and how this system called capitalism is maintained and functions and continues to function every single day. And that, you know, related to, to the nuclear bomb is the fact that this country and this system are built on genocide that was carried out by white settlers for white settlers. The genocide of the indigenous people was a conscious existential threat that was carried out in reality and enthusiastically enforced by white people. The onslaught on Africa, turning African people into commodities, work machines, ripping them away from family and homeland and language and culture, and the lynchings, the mass, mass you know, slaughter by white people, the torture, the convict leasing, the forced starvation of African indigenous communities and the, the so-called concentration camps called reservations. And you know, just every single day, the colonial degradation, a thousand police killings a year with, with, with African people having 25% higher chance of being murdered by the police than white people do. And a growing wealth gap, mass imprisonment, maternal and infant mortality, every aspect of life for African people, for indigenous people, for Mexican people in this country is, is colonized. There is colonialism inside the borders of the US. And we see the colonial genocide in Africa, in Congo, where the uranium for these bombs came from, from the colonized people of the Congo, where under King Leopold, at least 12 million African people were murdered and millions more had their hands cut off. In Kenya, where the British rounded up the, the resistance fighters and, and tortured them with ground up glass stuffed into their vaginas and anuses and executed them with mass hangings. And I could go on and on. We have smallpox infested blankets, brutal massacres like Sand Creek, in Colorado, where indigenous women, you know, where they, they cut babies out of, of the stomachs of the women and tossed them around and, and murdered and murdered elderly and children and 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 women there. And you know, there's there's a place in, in Idaho, Idaho, the Bear River Massacre, where 350 indigenous people were were slaughtered, and it was so bloody and and violent that actually you still can't farm in that area because they keep digging up bones of human beings. And there was you the trail- have one minute to finish up your thoughts. And I, yes, and I just wanna say that it was the US government that built the atomic bomb, the precursor of the bombs today to fight fascism. But the origin of that so-called fascism was Germany, but they didn't bomb Germany, they bombed Japan, a non-white country. And it was giving a message to African and non-white people around the world what could happen if they didn't follow what the US wants them to do. And so the only way to end the nuclear bomb and nuclear pro proliferation is to overturn this brutal colonial social system built on genocide and the existential threats to the rest of the world every single day for the last 600 years. And the Congress and the US president can't ever be trusted. It was a Democrat that dropped the bomb. It was, it was a Democrat that initiated this war against Russia through NATO. And the only way to, be, to overturn the system is to be organized in solidarity with African people, in unity with indigenous, Arab, Palestinian, and Asian peoples who are rising up to liberate their land and power. And, to say that the African People's Socialist Party is fighting to win with all the oppressed and colonized peoples and offers the ability for white people who want to be on the forward side of history to defeat the system, to be under their leadership, fighting as African internationalists, African internationalists in the white community and to fight this colonial mode of production and build a life-giving system led by African indigenous and oppressed peoples not built on death and destruction and bombs and murder and torture and, and building a society in which all human beings can live, no one at the expense 
of anybody else. And this is why Chairman O'Malley should tell who's fought for this his whole life, the liberation of Africa, and Jesse and I have been indicted by the system. And, uh, you know, I just want to say that no one, no white person who lynched Africans or murdered indigenous people were ever indicted by this government. But the first time white people are organized under the leadership of the African working class, we're indicted. So that just says what the system is. So I just want to say drop the charges on the Uhuru 3. Go to blackpowerblueprint.org to see the work of the African People's Socialist Party in St. Louis. Go to handsoffuhuru.org to donate to this legal fund that the African People's Socialist Party is building and go to uhurusolidarity.org to become a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, Uhuru. Thank you. Thank you so much, Penny. Lots of wisdom there, um, lots of history, lots of global impacts. Um, I just, wanted to add something here that now we're also we're seeing other members of the peace movement in the United States being branded in newspapers as Chinese agents so the the <laughs> and the first time that I was called a Russian agent or a Russian puppet you know it was Come on, I mean, we can be anti-war, we can be anti this war, we can be anti that weapon, we can be anti on our own with our own brains and our own minds. It's not because of anybody putting the thoughts inside of our heads. Um, and I think too, um, what Penny's pointing out here is that the US has no moral high ground on anything on anything, whether it's telling certain a certain country they can't have nuclear weapons, hold up, but we're the only ones to have used them. We were the only ones to have caused that kind of uh, destruction around the world. So um, I think Penny has reminded us of, a, of some really important themes. And then of course, the urgency of the case um, that, that she and um, others are facing, Chairman is facing, and uh, Jesse, Jesse Neville um, are facing. So I'm sure we can come back to some of these topics um, in the discussion, but I think we're going to move on now. And, and thanks for drawing connections with the nuclear weapon too, um, really important. Okay, so we're continuing. Um, Still on the topic of never again, no more Hiroshima's and Nagasaki's. Uh, we have Greg Coleridge, I hope I pronounced that right, um, who's co-director of Move to Amend and author of The Depth of Change, select, Selected Writings and Remarks on Social Change, written just last year, or published just last year. He maintains and distributes via email, a weekly real democracy history calendar and monetary history calendar. And that's the other thing, you know, who decides whether or not to drop the bomb? And there's no democracy in that. One person, maybe two people decide, give the order, millions, thousands, hundreds of thousands are killed or maimed. There's no democracy in that. He previously worked for the American Friends Service Committee served an elected term on the National Board of Common Cause, and was a principal with the Pope Program on Corporations, Law, and Democracy, Oakland. Greg, you're on. Well, thank you, Madeline. You sort of uh, have given much of my remarks, so I could- Oh, no, I'm sorry. Along. Oh, that's all right, that's all right. Uh, just wanted sure to thank, uh, thank you all for the invitation. Chris Mann, uh, thank you so much for reaching out, honored to be here with uh, other presenters and appreciate uh, all of you who have joined this program. As mentioned, I've worked for the American Friends Service Committee for more than 30 years, which is a peace and justice uh, organization recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1947. Cut my teeth on the National Nuclear Weapons Freeze campaign in Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, attended the 40th anniversary of the bombing of uh, Hiroshima back in 1985, where among the many things I heard was that many people escaped um, uh, Hiroshima 
those who survived and went to Nagasaki thinking that that was going to be a, a safe haven, which turned out uh, not to be the case. Uh, that the bomb dropped there, many people felt, was not the last bomb of World War II, but the first bomb of the Cold War against the Soviet Union uh, to continue to promote, um, as the previous uh, speaker mentioned and others, uh, colonialization, power projection, the uh, linkages of political and economic power, and a capitalist system that uh, you know plunders people in the planet. Uh, like many of you, I've opposed you know any number of weapon systems, military plans, wars, occupations, military contractors, war budgets. Uh, participated in you know any number of marches and vigils and rallies, walks, talks, conferences, teach-ins, lobbying, mm -hmm. sit-ins, die-ins, occupations. All of them are important. All contribute to uh, changing the culture, changing the narrative, helping people think differently from the dominant uh, top-down uh, narrative of the power elite. All are absolutely essential uh, to focus on alternatives. And in this case, alternatives to war uh, and for the purposes of the program this evening, alternatives to nuclear weapons uh, for conflict uh, resolution that is nonviolent. Hey, conflict is inevitable, but violence is not and certainly use of uh, weaponry and warfare that potentially can destroy the planet is, is, is not. Uh, many of you no doubt have heard the quote from, uh, was mentioned before, Albert Einstein, uh, sort of a famous or infamous one that says, the unleashing power of the atom has changed everything, save our mode of thinking, and thus we drift toward unparalleled catastrophe. Um, you know, Einstein felt that a mass awakening was essential for cooperation and peaceful conflict resolution. There could be no winners then and certainly not now, as uh, identified before in that uh, slideshow we saw before, with weaponry even more powerful than ever before. Uh, there can be no winners of a nuclear war, the existential threat of that time and to a great extent, our time. Thinking and acting otherwise would result in uh, unparalleled catastrophe. But new modes of thinking, are just as essential today as they are um, then. And um, they're essential today as we are on a similar trajectory, not just regarding uh, uh, nuclear conflagration, but uh, we are facing differing degrees of separate but interconnected other forms of systemic crises and existential threats, social, economic, environmental, political, and constitutional, meaning democratic. There is, on the pro positive side, uh, without question, and very heartening, an increasing awakening of the need for profound cultural and systemic change, with growing people's movements challenging existing institutions and proposing any number of alternatives. People are self-organizing, are they not, in social movements focusing on fighting racism, sexism, and homophobia. Economic movements are targeting inequality corporate globalization, and in many instances, capitalism itself, and its perpetual growth on a finite planet paradigm, which of course is idiocy uh, of the highest order, as well as environmental movements uh, aimed at the many threats, including certainly nuclear war, to a livable world for human beings and other living creations, as well as political movements that are addressing uh, here in a broad self-determination, self-governance, uh, sovereignty, democracy, and on the flip side, uh, dangerous uh, movements uh, that are out there focusing on fascism and nationalism. People are on the move, not all of which are in the right direction. Uh, so our thinking uh, needs to change. Old thinking and the systems and institutions based on you know, relic beliefs that oppress people, exploited places, and plundering the planet are, are legit. Uh, problems within systems require reforms, but problems of systems require transformational changes. And that's what these changing modes of thinking that uh, should not only apply to alternatives to nuclear war need to be about. It requires rejecting the notion that somehow our current uh, cultural and existing governing systems based on a constitution 
that favors property rights over human rights and the rights of nature uh, can somehow you know, be reformed uh, through decrees or laws or regulations or voluntary codes of conduct uh, and or simply you know, electing better political representatives locally, state and federal. Yeah, we need better people, no question about it. But those are just simply reformist. They're not, they don't go far enough. Changing modes of thinking must recognize that the ingrained influence of our system that legitimizes political money and elections and the governing power of corporations are themselves existential threats to anything remotely resembling self-governance, sovereignty, or democracy. Because, you know, as, as uh, Madeline correctly points out, if we don't have anything resembling legitimate self-governance or self-determination, uh, uh, we don't have a seat at the table uh, when decisions are made, fundamental decisions that affect our lives, our communities, uh, our families, our state, our nation, our world, uh, to the extent that our ecology is still left. And, you know, as they say, if you're not seated around the table, you are likely on the menu. And that is certainly the case for people without power, with people without money, people who have been historically oppressed in this country. We, the people, have never been all the people from day one. And so people uh, who have been historically oppressed, people of color and women and people without resources and more recently uh, trans uh, uh, phobic people um, or, or trans people and uh, themselves who have been subject to homophobic uh, discrimination. You know, these are people and communities that have been working to drive themselves into the Constitution to gain and have rights that should have been theirs all along. Uh, changing our modes of thinking must include challenging the cultural narrative that exists today, saying that politically and constitutionally, what's going on is inevitable, irreversible, preordained. It's the end of history. It's like gravity or the sun rising in the morning. We can't do a damn thing about it other than a few reforms here and there. Well, we've got to change that mode of thinking to reject that. It also means changing our mode of thinking uh, entails accepting that scales of solutions that we need to have must be equivalent or in kind to the scales of the problems we're facing. You know, small problems, small solutions. Medium problems, mig so me medium solutions. Existential problems, massive problems require fundamental and systemic solutions. We can't be about the business of feeling, well, this is the best we can get, or this is winnable. So let's focus on that instead of recognizing that history has shown and social movements have shown and people power movements have shown that what people think is impossible in one era becomes inevitable in the next. And you know, change doesn't happen until oftentimes it happens all at once. That's the history of how social change has happened in this country and abroad. And finally, you know, changing our modes of thinking must include a commitment to creating ra a radically inclusive, democratic and nonviolent people's movements that aren't just out there to do you know, symbolic stuff, trying to stop one thing at a time, one war, one weapon system, one whatever, because we don't have enough time, but working to build power, power, people power, that is trying to focus on system change. You know, our minds have been colonized. I'll sort of end it here to believe that we can only do so much, that we can only operate in this little square of uh, activism that is always getting smaller in every sphere as the power elites try to take away our ability to self-govern ourselves through laws, regulations, and even constitutional decisions that have anointed money as free speech and corporations as people. Gerrymandering is a piece of it. You know, other countries get things on the ballot. Uh, Switzerland, for example, you can get a national referendum calling for such and such if you just garner, you know, a couple hundred thousand uh, signatures. We don't have that in our system. Maybe that's something we should be working on. We need fundamental change that goes beyond electing better people, that goes beyond trying to get better sort of one at a time decisions, better laws, better regulations. We need all of those things, but it's simply not enough. We need to change our modes of thinking to not only stop the latest military plan, the latest threat coming from the powers to be, the latest war, you know, even the war in Ukraine right now is just the latest. There will be another one that comes if we survive this one, because 
The powers to be are simply trying to expand their own power and their own economic wealth and plundering as they plundered people, plundered indigenous people, plundered the land in this country is simply their default, how they work, how they exist. And we have to continue to, to not only focus on opposing those kinds of single issue, single problems, but think more horizontally and not vertically. And horizontally is ultimately having the power to decide, the power to make decisions affecting our lives. And toward that end, you know, what we're trying to do with Move to Amend is in fact trying to get away from simply opposing one at a time problems, whether they're economic, social, military, ecological, and focusing more on the horizontal that addresses issues of self-governance, democracy, right to decide, because without that, it's going to be hard metaphorically to get past first base on any of the issues we care about. And I'll put a few links of propaganda, I mean, <clears throat> information in the chat for individuals to check out what we're doing. Peace, look forward to the discussion uh, that we're going to have at the end of this pass. I love the way you use the word propaganda. Oops. Um, but I, I know people who have no problem with propaganda. It's just a matter of, you know, who's, whose it is and what it's saying. And most of us talk, say the truth, tell the truth. So call it what you will. <laughs> um, thank you, Greg. Um, and uh, in the interest of time, going to move to our next speaker. Oh, yes, but I did want to say international solidarity is very important for any of this. That's why the 120 countries that signed um, onto a statement calling for the total abolition of nuclear weapons is a sign of hope. And that's also one reason why I'm living in Colombia these uh, for for the foreseeable future, um, because the plundering of resources, Latin America has been one of the first on the list, um, and we all need to we all need to work together to keep that from happening in whatever way we can. So I'm gonna go on to Lynn Sableman, who's our next speaker. Uh, Hi there, Lynn can is you hear me? Yes, but let me finish. I'll, I'll introduce you <laughs> briefly anyway. Lynn is a member of the Disarm slash End War Group of the St. Louis Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, uh, one of the most, one of the longest, long, longest standing peace organizations in the U.S. and extremely inspirational. Lynn created and displayed a nuclear weapons abolition folk art Fiber pop-up exhibit, which appeared in the St. Louis area five times last year. She has her master's degree in education and was one of several founding teachers of Shining Rivers Waldorf School in St. Louis. As if this is not enough for one person to do, she's also a recently retired registered nurse. Lynn, you're on. Hi, thank you. Um, when I was a nurse, I worked at uh, St. Mary's Hospital for nine years in psych. And I believe that our nation is in need of intervention. Mm -hmm. We have, I think, symptoms of depression uh, with the denialism and we're suicidal, omnicidal right now, ignoring the warnings from uh, such uh, uh, a, a giant, for example, who, who left us this, this uh, past, well, this summer, uh, Daniel Ellsberg. He has uh, spent his life sharing uh, he, uh, his work in the Defense Department, and he is um, uh, a peace activist that once wanted to. Uh, lead us to nuclear abolition. And he considers his work at DARPA and in the, in the Department of Defense uh, as a nuclear war planner. Um, uh, he, he considers that a, a, an, an act of, uh, you know, 
uh, I can't remember that phrase. Um, anyway, uh, um, we have also the work of the uh, William Perry. I listened today to a, um, a uh, what's not, a work, a podcast, that's it, a podcast of the daughter of William uh, J. Perry, who was the Secretary of Defense under Clinton. And uh, they, together with uh, three generations, have put together accounts from the history of nuclear weapons. And today's podcast centered on the experience of a group of youths uh, who were invited to New Mexico in 1945. And they were at ballet camp, it was a class, and they were awakened by being thrown out of their uh, bunk beds at camp at five in the morning. This was uh, the Trinity blast and no one had been informed that there was a danger. In fact, there was a lot of reassurance uh, around future testing, the 500 uh, continued nuclear testing uh, that went on around the world, uh, just assurance, you know, radiation is, uh, you know, there's no such thing as it, uh, radiation, and uh, you're all safe. But today there's a different story. We know, we know in the newspaper, we had the Secretary of um, uh, Energy come and visit with the uh, Senator Cory Bush, who is representing the affected area. You know, St. Louis um, has a very difficult um, area to remediate. There are hundreds and thousands of tons of poorly managed government owned radio radioactive waste uh, spread uh, and contaminating over 100 sites just in the St. Louis metropolitan area. And today, people are aware of it. And part of that is through um, the activism of Kay Dry, who studied it all her life. She was a Wilf member. Um, the uh, Just Moms, Karen Nichols, um, people who did work on the ground, collected samples from Coldwater Creek, um, other activists. Um, that was essential uh, earlier in the history of St. Louis, there was the uh, research done, the study for um, discovering whether there was an impact from radiation on the population and it's called the baby teeth study. And that was done by a Wilf member as well. She, uh, Yvonne Logan gathered uh, samples from kindergartners everywhere in the St. Louis region and sent them away. Uh, this was done with Washington University and uh, the results came back and uh, were presented to uh, President Kennedy and it led to eventually the ban uh, on atmospheric testing and space testing. And um, that, that was uh, a very important thing. We had um, at that time, a lot of grassroots activism, um, a lot of mothers very concerned about children um, in, you know, taking in milk that is contaminated with nuclear waste. And the um, activism, the letters to your senators, to your Congress people, there was so much of that calling. Um, and I, I would like to see this kind of energy directed today. Um, you know, we have uh, good people in Congress. We have many bills now that ask for uh, the president to sign the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, uh, which, you know, the majority of the world, uh, nations of the world have uh, readily signed on to and, and ratified these 70 countries now have ratified it. That means that their 
country, their territory is prohibiting any, any um, kind of participation in nuclear weapons. Uh, the the um, systems of um, launching anything. And these are huge companies, private companies that are uh, producing these weapons of mass destruction. There's Boeing and Raytheon and so on. So I represented some of these challenges in this pop-up, um, the pop-up art thing. And you can, for example, the um, Princeton University simulation of the nuclear war plan, our nuclear war plan, and Russian, you know, uh, that would be triggered to respond. And the end of the world in the afternoon. Um, we, uh, Wilf was uh, active in the ICANN push to get this, um, this treaty ratified, uh, passed in uh, 2017. And I helped to organize the peace community through the World uh, um, Community Center and um, Veterans for Peace and so on, the peace gathering to March. Um, so I have a picture of that in the, in the um, pop-up art. But I, I would say with the petitions I've, I've tried to get signed and, and uh, organizing these annual uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki um, memorials every, every August, I would say that speaking to the choir is, is not what we need. We need something entirely different. We need to educate the public. I don't know why uh, schools and churches and universities, all universities work uh, in tandem with these labs, labs that uh, Los Alamos works with, university of, you know, funding uh, goes to the University of Texas and the University of Southern California. There is a lot of money, which is really the main impediment to progress, I feel. You know, it's the, the, these private, um, the lobbyists, we have the, those um, ICBM fields and the new Sentinel you know, uh, ICBM missile that is replacing the old ones, which are falling apart. Um, it's 450 ICBMs on hair trigger alert, which is the most dangerous weapon we have, says William Perry. Um, uh, there are uh, back from the brink movements that uh, have focused on threat, nuclear threat reduction. And this is, these are uh, things that uh, are part of bills that we're asking, you know, the bill asks uh, to take those, anything uh, that is on ready alert off, any nuclear weapons off ready alert, that will make us safer, the world safer, because we're talking about total thermonuclear war and destruction. But you in- have uh, One minute to finish the talk. Yes, very good. Uh, so, just a 3% of the world's nuclear arsenal can end with the world's survival because of the nuclear winter. And Carl Sagan, you remember, he did a lot of math and came up with, uh, you know, the, the world would plunge into, you know, 30 degrees, you know, below zero immediately and the darkness, nothing could grow. That's if you survive. It's something that we need to have more consciousness enough. And I think that, uh, and the stories are, are wonderful too, unbelievable and thrilling. The stories of the, of the Cuban Missile Crisis and the biographies, I, this is something I think we should bring to people. I have this pop-up if anybody wants to uh, get together with their church or have a reason to display it or invite the community to make art and bring it to there or put on a theater. Um, we'll put on a Sachiko, it's a children's story about a family that survived the Hiroshima bombing. This is very powerful. I think this is where we need to work for grassroots understanding for our future. Okay. To preserve the world in the future.
Um, Lynn, I, I, we're going to run your uh, pop up video. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Um, to get the sound, somebody in the audience was coaching. Yeah, before you start the video, before you actually start the share. So, so end the share. And then as okay. you start share, click right at the bottom. I haven't done this for a while, Chris. But okay. Right at the bottom, Go you ahead. click on something that says start computer audio. You see it when you first start the, to share your screen. Yes, yeah, share sound. Yes, yeah, share sound and then, then open it up. Then share. Okay. Now it's, we'll play. It's based on my memory. Being <laughs> like me, you don't vouch for it any longer. <laughs> No, hit the little right down at the bottom arrow. arrow. Yes, hit the little, little arrow. arrow. Yeah. A little arrow right here. We go back up to the screen so we can see what you were doing. Yeah, now the uh, arrow right here. Down. There we right. go. Never mind. That there one. Go. Yep. And it has on it two heroes from the Soviet officers, Vasily Archipov. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, he is the one who the uh, missileers trusted after having uh, years of experience with his leadership. They trusted him and his uh, his uh, estimation of what the Americans were thinking. So bomb, the nuclear weapons, nuclear missiles were not sent into the United States. This is another hero. He has a movie made about him, a Danish movie, Stanislav Petrov, and he too used his good judgment he had a cool head and he didn't keep the communication going up the line to let go of all of the nuclear arsenal that the Soviets had. This picture is about, this is the capital. This is uh, New York City maybe back here. This is money. These are the private uh, missile companies and, and uh, launch component companies that are paying millions of dollars to the ICBM caucus to keep jobs in those four states that host the ICBMs, etc. Big money. Here's another side. Oh, here are some depictions of the trouble we're in. These are past experiences. There was a chip misplaced and it almost led to nuclear war. Here, this is a nuclear terrorism. These are the nine buttons and the nine uh, nuclear possessing uh, countries. Oh, no, these are the three flags of our, quote, enemies, uh, North Korea, China, Soviet Union. Here is a bear that caused a near uh, full on um, crisis that could have led to total nuclear war. We have geese here, a guy, he's a lone terrorist. So, uh, do we have another one? This is a nuclear war cannot be won and should never be fought. And all of the leaders are saying this now. This is a city and it is being emulated. Here's a last one. This is the solution. This is 2775, House Resolution 275. Warheads to windmills. Take the two trillion invested in the modernization of all of our nuclear weapons and make that uh, money invested in the Green New Deal, in, in um, making our green, our, uh, our uh, economy a green economy, not fossil fuel based. We'll all be healthier if we do that. Thank you. This part. Okay. Thank you. Wow, that was, that's something um, uh, with all those illustrations of sides. It's a, it's a cube, all right, with all kinds of things. Really well done. Um, and I echo the fact that, you know, the stories of survivors 
and their families are what can turn people's minds around. I swear, if you know, the first time I heard one of the Hibakusha from Japan speak in the U.S. about what occurred that day in the scenes, and and he showed pictures that had been drawn by people of the skin falling off. I mean, that's the kind of thing that everybody should see. Um, and that's the kind of thing I think that turns people's minds around. Uh, so thank you, Lynn, for all your work and for allowing us to share that. And I wanna go on to our, our final speaker for tonight. Um, and But before he speaks, I just want to suggest that you all, if you have questions from any of the presentations or any questions from what Dan Kowalik is going to say, you know, type them, um, you know, you can type them into the chat or think about them. And we're going to have people making questions or comments after Dan is finished, two minutes or less. So we can um, have as many people participate as possible. So that's just a heads up. Um, so I'm going to introduce Dan Kowalik, um, but it is only going to be a brief summary of the things that Dan has done. Um, he graduated from Columbia Law School in 1993 and currently teaches international human rights, which is what this is all about, at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. He is the author of Nicaragua, A History of U.S. Intervention and Resistance, came out this year, and The Plot to Overthrow Venezuela, How the U.S. is Orchestrating a Coup for Oil, came out in 2019. He served as in-house counsel for the United Steelworkers for 26 years. Not old enough to have done all that, Dan. <laughs> he, has, he has written extensively on the issue of international human rights and U.S. foreign policy for the Huffington Post, Counterpunch, and RT, uh, RT News, and has lectured throughout the world on these subjects. He recently completed trips to Russia and to the Donbass region, as well as, we found out tonight, Nicaragua. Dan? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And the presentations preceding me have been amazing. So um, hard to follow. But I'll just say, first of all, open by saying President Joe Biden himself has said that we are closer to a nuclear apocalypse than we have been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Those are his words. And yet the Biden administration is doing nothing to bring us from the brink of nuclear war. In fact, it appears they're doing everything they can to guarantee we're going to have a nuclear war. And that is what is very scary. The uh, war in Ukraine, which began in 2014, first of all, we need to acknowledge that. Okay, 14,000 people died in the conflict between the Ukrainian government and their own people in the Donbass before Russia intervened last year. And, but Russia's intervention last year was totally preventable. Had Joe Biden been willing to just simply say Ukraine won't be part of NATO and had the West prevailed upon Ukraine to stop attacking the Donbass as they had been doing. But they, were, they didn't want to do that because the West, in, in particular the United States, wanted this conflict to weaken Russia and undermine Russia. And now we're facing a possible world war over all this. And so really it's up to us to demand of our government to take us back from the brink to find a way to negotiate with Russia, to negotiate a settlement of this issue that we're facing. Just like, you know, the US did under John F. Kennedy in 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, 
in 13 days, Kennedy and Khrushchev resolved their differences over the Cuba Missile Crisis. And it took a give and take. Uh, Russia agreed to take the missiles out of Cuba and Kennedy agreed, one, not to invade Cuba and two, to take our weapons, our nuclear weapons out of Turkey. And many have called what's happening now a reverse Cuban Missile Crisis. And what does that mean? I mean, just as the U.S. felt an existential threat from the Soviets' uh, missiles on, in Cuba, Russia has felt for years uh, an existential threat from uh, missiles, uh, U.S. missiles on the border of Russia in places like Poland and Romania and NATO troops on the Russian borders. I mean, this is the reverse of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And yet, unlike during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when Kennedy was willing to make concessions to lower the temp on that, um, Biden is unwilling to make any concessions to Russia to uh, bring us back from the brink of nuclear war. And that is what we're facing. That is the biggest issue we're facing right now in the world. And we need to lift our voices and build a peace movement that will call upon our government to deal with Russia and to find a way for peace in Ukraine and the rest of the world. Um, I mean, that's the big takeaway, I think, right now. Um, meanwhile, in terms of the day, in terms of uh, August 9th and the memory of Nagasaki. It's important to remember a few things. First of all, the bombing of Hiroshima a few days before and then the bombing of Nagasaki were totally unnecessary, right? To end the war with Japan. I think most historians agree with that, that the Japanese were willing to surrender by the way, mostly because the Soviet Union was bringing 1.5 million troops into Japan. And certainly, whatever anyone thinks about what happened in Hiroshima, there was no need for the attack on Nagasaki three days later, right? These were huge human rights abuses, huge crimes against humanity that killed hundreds of thousands of people. And the U.S. has never, ever uh, apologized for this, given reparations for this. Um, and that is truly disturbing. The U.S. is the only, only country in the world that's ever used nuclear weapons um, against a foreign power. And um, that can never be forgotten. And then we have to remember the U.S. used nuclear weapons against its own people, right? You know, uh, I met the Bikini Beach uh, nuclear veterans. These were soldiers who the U.S. experimented on by, you know, um, exploding nuclear bombs on Bikini Beach and seeing how it would affect the locals there and our own soldiers. And, of course, people develop cancers and whatnot. And so this is a longstanding issue. And people mention the movie Oppenheimer, which I think everyone needs to watch. I think it's an excellent movie. But as people said, you know, there are some very important omissions. One is the impact on the people in Japan of the bombs. Also, the impact of the indigenous people in New Mexico, many of whom developed cancers after, after the testing in Los Alamos. And it was only near the end of Oppenheimer where they make one allusion to the fact. They do make an allusion to the fact that is somewhat mentioned here, that the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima and then Nakasagi was not the end of World War II, but the beginning of the war with the Soviet Union, the beginning of the Cold War. Um, at least that was at least mentioned near the end of, of Oppenheimer. But in any case, um, we are facing now the potential of nuclear disaster. 
And we are the only people who can stop it by stopping our own government from pushing us to the edge of that. So with that, I thank you all very much. Thank you, Dan. You surprised me, in fact. Um, but I'm thank you so much for your insights and all the work you do. I'll just ask you, do you have any thoughts on how we can do that? How we can organize together um, to stop this government from first continuing with what's going on in Ukraine and then possibly China? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the good thing is we have an election coming up in November 2024. And so this is a very opportune time for us to uh, protest the Biden administration, to write letters to the editor and the newspapers, to um, write letters to our Congress people uh, saying we don't want this war in Ukraine. And we don't want a nuclear war. Right now, the good news is I saw, you know, the most recent poll shows a majority of the U.S. people are against further military aid to Ukraine, which I think is wonderful. So what it means is that the people like us raising our voice on this issue are having an impact. And we just need to keep doing that. We need to raise our voice everywhere we can on the streets in the halls of Congress, um, in letters to the editor, editors of our newspaper, on social media. We need to make it clear this war, as long as it goes on, will only uh, create more suffering of both Ukrainians and Russians and will lead the world to uh, the brink of a disaster that none of us want. So we just need to keep that message clear and keep saying it. And I think, you know, I think we can win this. That That's my message. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan. Um, I, I can't read all the comments in the chat um, because I don't know something happened with my chat a long time ago and the type is really large. I just saw a comment about Palestinians but I didn't see what came before it. Um, I'm going to interject that when we talk about ind indigenous, we're also talking about Palestinians and that the world opinion ap appears to be changing um, from wholehearted, full-throated support of the right-wing extremist government in Israel right now to one that understands how destructive the government has been. Um, but I didn't see the entire comment that preceded it. Um, then, are there questions? Yeah, I was wondering if the rest of the panelists could comment uh, on how, first of all, do you believe that the peace movement can stop the war? Um, and then secondly, how do you want how how do you think the best way would be to go about it uh, the the war has been going on for if we're counting from two, four, 2014 uh a year and a half two years and there's been two very small peace demonstrations in washington so how do we crack that. And then if there is a person here from the Trinity uh, organization, if maybe they would want to speak for a minute or so. But do the, do the other panelists, can they respond to the question about the peace movement? Uhuru, this is Penny. Chris, can you hear me? I can't, yes. yeah. Okay, yes. Well, I would just like, if I could, I just wanted to, first of all, you know, really, I want to appreciate this forum and thank you very much for having us on. And I just want to say that anything that we're talking about, we have to say 
that we are going to stand and defend Chairman Omali Ishitawa because this government wants to send him to prison. And they have a very serious attempt to do that in a way that is going to be precedent setting in terms of the uh, prohibition on free speech in this country. And I was talking to the panelists prior to this meeting, you know, prior to it starting. And, you know, first of all, we can't say that we're going to allow the African liberation movement again to be attacked by the U.S. government, by the colonial state, by the FBI, COINTELPRO, all that. And secondly, we have to say that if they go ahead and attack the chairman, that we, there won't be the freedom of speech to even have this, this kind of forum here. So I really want to call on, on the Green Party of Missouri, and I know in here in St. Louis, Angelica, Don, and others have stood with, with the Uhuru movement and really, really appreciate that. I know Chris has too, but I do want to you know, call on people to go to handsoffuhuru.org and, and donate, you can join, you can join the Hands Off Coalition. And I just want to say about the question of, of the nuclear power and the nuclear threat, that again, we have to start with the reality that this system and all of us sit on the pedestal of 100, 300 million indigenous people already slaughtered in order for us to have this country, to be here. The, the hundreds of millions of Africans who were kidnapped and enslaved throughout this hemisphere and inside the borders of the United States are colonized. So the fact is that there's no way that this system is ever going to stop killing or murdering the people on the planet Earth. And that, that nuclear power is just an extension of its colonial policies that are genocidal around the world, that we have to we have to be part of overturning this system. This is a trillion dollar Pentagon. It's a Pentagon, you know, the military industrial complex, they call it. They're not going to yeah. give up their power because some people say stop nuclear weapons. And that okay. what is the biggest fossil, what is the biggest, biggest commodity in the world? Most powerful is oil and fossil fuels. So, it, you know, this system has to be overturned and we don't need a new mode of thought. We need a new mode of production in which the oppressed and colonized peoples have power over their lives. And we cannot find a solution as long as we still sit on this pedestal of the oppression of African and indigenous peoples and oppressed people and the Palestinians. And, yeah. and Penny, can I ask you, we, we asked for two minutes at this point in time, so other people can speak as well. I, I apologize. I don't mean to cut you off. Can you say one more line and then move on to the next? Well, I would just ask everybody to go to handsoffuhuru.org and, you know, and just uh, just sign up there, get on the mailing list, donate. Um, you know, we're, we're building this front and, and it is extremely important. And believe me, when African people have power, when indigenous people have power, we're not going to have wars of destruction and you know mass murder around the world anymore. That's how we'll have a, a system in which all human beings can live, nobody at the expense of anybody else. So thank I you so much, Penny. I group. thank you so much. Anyone else have something that they need to say or ask or oh, other panelists to respond to Chris? to Chris's um, question, um, but if no, if no other panelists, we haven't heard from anyone um, yet in the audience. Um, it's only been here the speakers. Is, here is a question from Russ. How do we change our culture to change the culture? Mm -hmm. Russ, do you wanna make your comment? Yes, that was a typo. I mean, how do we change our, the culture uh, that we've been talking about, war, cultural oppression, cultural capitalism, in order to uh, 
change these issues that we've been talking about. As Greg said and Penny said, these are very systemic basic issues. And we have to make very basic changes in what our society and people believe and how they function. And I don't know how to do that. Yeah, I just, I, I would say one thing because when I was in Japan, um, 2015, there was a, the, the Japanese had changed their constitution after World War II to forbid and prevent war. It was part of their constitution. And yet the US was putting pressure on Japan to change that. And I, when one of the meetings I attended, there was a young man who was 23 or 24, and he and other youth were in the streets every week to protest at the parliament building to say, after 70 years of peace, no one wanted to be the first person to go to another country and die on foreign soil fighting for their government. Um, but they had had 70 years of a culture of peace. Um, I don't know how we get to a culture of peace, but I was really moved by that young man saying, you know, after all this time without war, no one wanted to be the first to go and fight somewhere else. Hi, you had your hand up then Martin, and then Barbara, Barbara Lackson. Yes, uh, at the risk of ruffling some feathers, I think uh, peace activists need to do some uncomfortable self-scrutiny and ask a question that is too seldom asked. Namely, with all of the energy um, um, expended by dedicated people, sometimes over a lifetime of activism, within dozens, if not hundreds of activist groups, why is there no broad front? Why is there no synthesis of all of these entities into a combined national peace movement? This is a question that's bothered me ever since I became active a few years ago uh, in uh, GPACs and, and the Green Party. And until that question is answered, we are going to be a very fragmented and balkanized uh, group of people. So I think the start of changing the culture is changing the culture within uh, US and, and international activism and moving toward a more pragmatic sharing of goals. Recently, there was a small anti-war demonstration that involved both uh, uh, left-wing uh, activists and libertarians. And there was a hue and cry within the Green Party as to how could we uh, possibly associate with people who differed with us on a number of other points. And this is the kind of schismatic uh, weakness that bedevils uh, peace activists and prevents them from joining in common cause. Uh, the fact that both Donald Trump is, and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. are notionally running on anti-war platforms uh, should be a, a hopeful sign, but people recoil against both of those candidates because a number of other issues are not uh, correct from their point of view. So that's my view. Uh, there, you know, there's an old quote from Pogo, we've met the enemy and uh, he's us. To some degree, that's true of uh, the activist community. Thank you, and I think um, forums like this are a way of connecting issues together. You know, sometimes we don't do that in our programs, but I think this this program we have, and that's a hopeful sign, Martin. And after Martin, it's Barbara Laxon, and then Logan, and then if someone who hasn't spoken, um, we will proceed that way. Go ahead, Martin. Yes, um... Thinking back of my own personal experience <clears throat> in 67 and 68, when there were a few people coming around opposing the war, what we did as we went out, what we did is dramatically display our positions. What we did is stand in our truth and our power built from there. We can't wait for everybody to get on the bus. 
the bus is moving and it's moving towards disaster. We stop the bus. It's difficult to address this question given the commitment of decades of my own life in supporting substance of change, but we have not seen it. What we've seen is a caricature of change. What we've seen is no intention of en enabling or empowering the people. What we see, yes. we have to change. And whatever it takes and however we do it, we bring our message loud and clear <clears throat> in a way. The people of the Diné went through the, the tragedies of uranium mining. The people of New Mexico Tularosa Basin went through the tragedy of downwinders for that impacted their families for generations. The people of Japan mm. mass murdered by a single action. The two like minutes two is up. Can you um, wrap up your thoughts? Make a determination of how important it is to you personally and go from there. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Um, and um, I'm calling on people who haven't spoken yet. Uh, Logan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, excellent, excellent uh, webinar. And uh, thanks for everybody that worked on this and is, is showing it. Um, uh, this last weekend, there was a, an attack on Code Pink in the New York Times. And uh, it, I think is symptomatic that we're going to see a very repressive uh, period ahead here and an escalation of wars. Uh, the United States is talking about intervening in Haiti, uh, uh, probably very shortly. The national news is having articles about it. Uh, they're talking about sending troops into uh, Niger, Niger, I can't, Niger, uh, Niger, uh, and at the same time, I think there's a political repression that's going to probably take part across the board. Um, there are peace demonstrations being called for at the end of September. Um, and I think we need to build unity. One of the key things is, is the whole process of building unity, and particularly with African-American people, uh, both uh, with the, the folks in, uh, that uh, Penny talks about, but across the board with uh, uh, we're in a unique position to have Cornell West uh, campaigning for the nomination for the Green Party. But there's, you know, the, the key to building unity is working with minority groups across the board uh, and to do massive education. Uh, but the challenge before us is great. And I think time is running out on us. And so we really have to put the pressure on ourselves and our communities to, to mobilize. Um, there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one fighting. There's still a lot of confusion about the war in Ukraine uh, and the role of the United States. Uh, but we, we, we really need to educate people on uh, the need for a ceasefire and, and de-escalation uh, in Ukraine, Samoya, and Syria. Uh, and the work has got to, you know, this is a, a big step in that process and appreciate everybody's help. Um, and um, we in Ohio are going to try to do our part. Okay, thank you, Logan. Barbara Laxon. Yeah, I just wanted to say something that that you know, as as a green, uh, and and a lot of people uh, don't think about it, but one of the ways to make change is to work for ranked choice voting. So we can actually get a authentic, you know, person that 
we really want uh, into office. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there and remind people this is something you need to be working on. It's a very positive way to make change and it's it's pretty straightforward and uncomplicated. Um, that's it. Thanks, Barbara. It's almost 10 o'clock, folks. I've got Russ, who has spoken briefly, and I have Penny, who's um, who could wrap us up, or if there's someone else who hasn't said anything, um, this would be the time, because um, I'm checking in with Chris and Hyde. Don't think we want to go much beyond um, the top of the hour. Is that correct? It will be two hours. Um, Let me just mention a different kind of idea. Go Come ahead, on. Russ. No, I was going to call on you. I was just trying to see if there would be someone else yeah. sin, um, to call that needed to or wanted to say something before Penny. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say I'm working with a local group on a very different way to create peace. The group is is in Portage County, which is where. Kent State University is located. <clears throat> and we have a group called the Kent Interfaith Alliance for Racial Reconciliation and Justice. So obviously it's a, it's a focused idea about the racial tension, but the, we've done all kinds of things, all the protests and marches and seminars and all kinds of stuff, educational things. We're going to um, do a different kind of thing this year in which we're thinking about doing wearing large buttons that says Kifa for a beloved community, following after Martin Luther King's idea of a, of a peaceful, uh, non-racist community. And we're going to wear those buttons, not at our churches, not we're going to go out to places like turkey shoots and uh, town hall meetings and open houses for the fire department and uh, the Lions, the Gwanis, all of those kind of groups, and just participate in their event and say, we're here to, to see what you're doing and to share and talk and listen to them and share with what we're concerned about, our perspectives about race and war, et cetera. And it's our way to change the culture. And I don't know if it's a good idea or bad, but it puts us on the line by going to all the uh, Tea Party meetings and everybody else wearing those buttons. Thanks. Thank you, Russ. Can you put in the chat what was gonna be on the button? Can you type it in, please? Sure. Okay, and then um, if anybody else needs to, you know, direct people to a website or something, I know most of you have already done that. But if you could, if others could do that, so it's on the record when we share this webinar, you can please do that now. And did I see uh, someone say that Nia Kumba Nia has a question? Kumba, anybody? No. Yes, no. Okay. Then Penny, you will have the last word tonight um, because I think we've just about hit the yeah. 10 o'clock time. I just wanted to let everybody know, and I'm sorry, I don't know GPUS Zoom 3. I don't know your name, but you raised about the anti-war movement. I just want to let you know that the Black is Back Coalition in unity with the Hands Off Uhuru Coalition is holding a March on, Wa on Washington on November 4th, on Saturday, November 4th of this year. UNAC is on board, the Leonard Peltier Committee, Jericho, um, Union de Barrio, you know, just many, many, many other organizations, Socialist Workers Party, Green Party of Florida, Green Party of New Jersey are on board for this. So I hope people can, can come out to that, have a caravans. This is against the war, against the war, against the African community and against Russia and against the oppressed and colonized peoples around the world. So you can go to blackisbackcoalition.org um, and sign up for that. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. And on that note, um, I would think, 
we can thank everybody for their their speeches and presentations and their ideas and their insights and to do everyone who attended hope that you have things to bring back with you i believe we're going to be sending a follow-up email to everyone who has attended um, if we have was when you registered i think we have your email addresses and uh i'll just say good night we should all say good night and thank you.